Hi everyone, welcome to the next unit for SI-335. This unit is about number theoretic computation. So that sounds intimidating, um, but let me just say a little bit of what this actually means. Um, so it really means we're gonna be looking at a little bit of crypto, uh, in, in particular the RSA algorithm, and we're gonna learn a little bit of, actually we're gonna learn a lot of how that works. And then as all things in this class, it's an excuse when we look at like the last unit was kind of about sorting, but it was also an excuse to look at divide and conquer techniques and to learn a little bit about lower bounds. How do we prove lower bounds on problems and, and thinking at that next level? And so we're going to also look at some of those things here, like uh, we'll see a little bit more of divide and conquer. And we'll also talk about difficulty and why problem difficulty actually matters in this context of crypto. So we have a few different goals in this unit. I wanna say that it's all kind of centered towards learning about this RSA algorithm. Um, and then along the way, we're gonna look at, learn some important things like what does polynomial time mean? Um, what is uh, the importance of understanding the difference between checking something versus being able to compute it? And those are some of really important uh, concepts besides the specific application to the RSA encryption. Those are some important concepts that are going to come up again and again throughout the class. And so this is uh, kind of what I just said, uh, you know, why are we talking about number theory? Um, so first of all, this when we say number theory, you can think of it as like thinking about integers and, and mod. Um, and more formally, in terms of mathematics, we talk about mathematical structures. This means uh, when we treat numbers like under mod p or mod n, uh, when, we, when we treat numbers with those certain operations, what does that look like compared to like just the integers or rational numbers? That's the things that mathematicians care a lot about. Um, but again, for us, we're going to be focused on analysis and algorithms and uh, the, the application towards cryptography. And another point here that I also want to bring up is that there's a strong history with computing and, and dealing with integers. Um, you can think of every byte in your computer is, is really represented, representing a single integer, um, like from 0 to 255. And so there's a lot of uh, historical importance as well, which informs us when we're learning about other algorithms, uh, a lot of them come back to these classic uh, number theoretic concepts and algorithms. So the first thing we want to talk about, and we'll spend a little bit of time with this, is it's the size of an integer. And the two big takeaways here, uh, which we'll get into, is that the size is not the same as the value. That's a statement that may seem a little bit con counterintuitive, like size and value, or doesn't that mean the same thing? Maybe in layman's uh, speak, they do. But in the context of this class, and we're talking about algorithms, we want to be precise all, all the time with our language. And this is a good example of that. Um, and it's going to have a real importance when we're talking about um, asymptotic complexity and the difficulty of things that's important for cryptography being secure. So that's what we're going to talk about in the context of integer factorization. OK, so the question is, how big is an integer? Um, so the how big is it? Really, when we talk about how big something is in a computer, we want to say, like, how many bytes does it take to represent that? Right, so if it's an array with 100 ints in it, so if we have a 100 int array, well, each int is 4 bytes, so that's 400 bytes. we can just write with a capital B. But now if we have a number, if we have an integer, like uh, 1,000, what's the size of that? Well, the size of it is not 1,000. The value is 1,000. OK, so the value is 1,000. But the size is how much memory does that take up? And 1,000 you can store within two bytes. Um, there is a type that takes only two bytes. It's a uh, short in, uh, in C or C++. So we can store that in just two bytes. In fact, we can store it in 10 bits if we want to be 
as tight as possible, but um, okay, two bytes is 16 bits, and that's the closest we can get in terms of bytes. What about uh, if we thought about the other way around? So what would a 400 byte integer be? So what would the value of an integer be that takes up the same room as this relatively small size 100 array? Well, think about that. It would be uh, as large as two to the 400 times eight, because 400 bytes, each byte is eight bits. So that means that uh, that's going to be 3,200 bits. So that's about two to the 3,200. That is a literally astronomically large number. In fact, it's 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 beyond astronomically large. Uh, there's no number. I think if you counted the number of atoms in the universe times the number of like Planck moments since the Big Bang, it would not be as large as two to the 3,200. So this is a beyond astronomically large number. It has no meaning in the physical world that we could ever imagine. Um, but why is it still useful? It's because it's it's a big number and numbers have certain properties that allow us to do things like encoding or cryptography. And so when we're talking about big integers, big numbers in a computer, it's really big on this scale. So this is a big number. And what I want to point out is that this is a number that's, you know, like I said, beyond astronomically large, has no meaning in the physical universe. And yet we can store it really easily in a computer, right? When's the last time you, you wrote a program that created a size 100 array? It happens, you know, before you can finish lifting up your finger from the keyboard in, your, in any language, in Python or C or, or anything you like, even JavaScript. Um, and so in the same way, we can take advantage of this is kind of the power of, of why these large numbers and understanding number theory becomes important here, especially when we're talking about cryptography, is um, that the we can take only a few bytes to write this number down, but it's it's so astronomically large that it's uh, there's some things that are really difficult to do with that, and that's kind of the whole essence of secure cryptography. <clears throat> and so, if we want to be more precise, um, if we have uh, n is the value, then, so n is the value, then this expression right here is the size, right? So that's what we were saying. Uh, so it's the ceiling of log base 2 of n plus 1. It's basically log n. Um, that's the size, how many bits it'll take up in memory. And so when we talk about single precision, we're talking about, you know, ints or, du or double, I guess double would be not an integer, but int or long or those kind of things uh, that's either 32 or 64 um, bits usually. And multiple precision means any size. So in the previous slide, when I mentioned something that would take up 400 bytes, that's going to be a multiple precision integer. That's not one of the built-in basic types. Um, and, and the difference, again, is that when we deal with just ints or longs, we can just say that the size of that is big theta of 1 because, okay, it's almost like 64 bits or something. Um, but when we talk about multiple precision integers, we really have to account for how many bytes they take up. And that's going to be log of n, uh, where n is the number n is the actual value of the number. OK, let's look at an example. This is getting a little bit abstract. Let's think about prime factorization. Um, so prime factorization means you're given a number, and you want to figure out what are the um, prime factors, what are the dividers of it. And in fact, we can simplify this down to just computing a single prime factor. Um, so for example, if I take a number like 105, OK, uh, what is 105 equal to? Well, you might know that this is 7 times 15. And we can break that down further. This is because 15 is 3 times 5. So this is actually 3 times 5 times 15. I'm oh, sorry, 3 times 5 times 7. OK, so that's this is the complete factor is prime factorization of 105 because each of these factors is now a prime. And the point of when we're trying to think about doing factoring, we really just have to like try to extract one prime factor from that, like seven or three or five. Because what happens when once you can get one prime factor out of it, 
then you just divide by that and then you can continue with the other part. So if we knew that seven is a factor of 105, we can divide by seven, we're left with 15, and then we can factor that further. Or if we knew that three, in fact, you might know a trick that if you add up the digits here at six, which is divisible by three, so you know this is divisible by three, and then you could divide by three would give you uh, 21, uh, sorry, would give you 35, and then you could factor 35 into five times seven. Okay, so the question is, given a number, we want to compute a prime factor of that number. So given 105, you want to compute one factor of it, like three. And this is an algorithm that'll do that. So it takes in any number n and returns a prime p that divides n. And here's how it works. It just tries all of the factors starting from two. Um, notice we have to start at two because everything is divisible by one. Uh, and then for each, it's only going to go up to this point. So we'll talk about that in a second. Though, so this is the actual divisibility check right here. This is saying, um, is n divisible by i? And if it is, we return it. Otherwise, we increase i to the next factor up. So let's talk about a couple things here. First of all, um, why does this divisibility check make sense? Well, this is doing mod. So if you think about like 105 mod 5 would be 0. Why is 105 mod 5, uh, why does that give us 0? Because 5 divides 105, because 105 is divisible by 5. Same with 105 mod 3, or 105 mod 15, or 105 mod 7. Those would all give us 0, because 105 is divisible by all those numbers. And uh, the other thing to notice is, uh, and this is important for the running time of this algorithm, why, what is this condition all about? So why can we stop here? This also tells us kind of why does this number um, return a prime. So this stops when i squared, when the factor that we're looking at is greater than n, which means that um, equivalently, Uh, it stops when i exceeds the square root of n. Now, why can we do that is because factors always come in pairs. So if you think about 105 again, okay, I'm going back to the same number. Um, we said we can write 105 is 7 times 15. Now, the, the square root of 105, you, you don't know exactly what the square root of 105 is, neither do I, but I know it's something between 10 and 11 because 10 squared is 100 and 11 squared is 121. So what that means is that 7 is less than the square root and 15 is greater than the square root. And that's not a coincidence. That's always going to be the case. If you think about it, for any number that if we're dividing it into factors, one of those two things that we're dividing is always going to be less than the square root. The other one's going to be bigger than the square root. The only exception to that is if they're both exactly equal to the square root, like 25 is 5 times 5, because 5 is the square root of 25. And so what that means is that if we've searched all the factors of this number up to the square root, then if we haven't found a prime factor yet, we're never going to find one. Um, so if you think about a, for example, a prime number like 29, what would we have to divide 29 by to check that it's really prime, to check that it really doesn't have any divisors? Well, we only actually have to check with things which are less than the square root of 29. So we could start with i equals 2. OK, so um, it's not divisible by 2. It's not divisible by 3, 4. Uh, it's not divisible by 5. And it's not divisible by 6. But we don't, we don't even have to get as far as 6, because already 6 squared is 36, which is bigger than 29. So we didn't even have to check that one. We really only have to check 2, 3, 4, and 5 to know that 29 is a prime number. Because if it had any divisors, it would have at least one factor that was less than that square root. So that's the logic of why this works. And the running time that we're going to get out of it is big theta of square root of n. And now the question here is, is this fast? Should we consider this to be an efficient algorithm? Well, if you think in the context of what we're thinking about with like uh, list operations and sorting lists and stuff like that, um, it seems pretty good, right? Square root of n is faster than linear time. Square root of n is much faster than n log n. 
It's much, much faster than n squared. So this seems like, wow, this is faster than like every sorting algorithm that we've seen. It's faster than finding the max in a list. This is super, super fast. It's not quite as fast as like binary search, but it's pretty fast. Okay, but now we have to think about, wait a second, what did we just talk about? We talked about the difference between the size versus the value of an integer. So in terms of the value, which is n, in terms of the value, it's fast. Right, so the value of this number is n. And in terms of that, this algorithm is really fast. Square root of n is really fast. But in terms of the size, well, what's the size of n? The size of n is, is basically log n, right? And in terms of that size, this is not so fast. Okay, so if, if, I, um, if I wrote n equals, or s equals log of n, let's, let's do some math here for a second. If I write s is the size, so s equals log base 2 of n, or ceiling of log base 2 of n, but I'll just say log base 2 of n, then what is square root of n? You can figure this out, so n, if s is log n, then n is 2 to the power s. And so that means that square root of n is this to the power 1 half, so it's 2 to the s divided by 2. What does this mean? This is just some math now. Um, 2 to the s by s divided by 2, that's exponential time. which is super slow. So what that means is that if we're trying to find a factor of, a, let's say, a single precision number, like an int, this is going to be fine. Um, this is going to run in square root of that value, and the value is relatively small. So this, this is a perfectly fine approach. But if we're talking about truly large numbers, like a number that's the size of a you know, of a size 100 list, a 400 byte number like we talked about, this will never ever finish. This is exponential time um, with, in sec except for numbers that are really, really tiny um, in terms of their size, this is basically never gonna finish. And that's the key importance. So this is already something that's, it's showing us what are some pitfalls and how we have to understand the meaning of complexity a little bit better. So when we look at something like big theta of square root n, we have to think about what does that n mean? In this case, n is not the size of the input, n is the value of that integer. And so this thing, which looks like it's fast, because we're thinking square root of n is like, oof, even faster than linear time, faster than sorting. Absolutely not. It's a super, super slow algorithm if we are dealing with actually large uh, numbers. And so this comes into, uh, so this is what I just said. Uh, this comes into a definition that's going to be important for a while and, and especially important towards the end of this class when we talk about P versus NP and some of the most important unsolved problems in algorithms and in computer science generally, um, is the definition of polynomial time. So we have to know when should we consider an algorithm to be fast or slow? And there's a lot of ways to answer that question, but one really rough way to answer it is that if it's polynomial time, meaning if it's um, any uh, constant raised from the size of the input, this is called fast. It might not be actually fast, like an n to the fifth algorithm is not that fast, but this is going to be, um, or I should say feasible. Yeah, I think that's the word that they used anyway. Like this means that it, an algorithm is within reach for large inputs if we can run it in polynomial time. So when we thought when we talked about everything with sorting, you know, um, selection sort, insertion sort, merge sort, uh, binary search, linear search, finding the max of a list, those are all polynomial time feasible algorithms. Uh, and what that means is that if it's so, what's not polynomial time is really if it's exponential time. because that wouldn't be like n to the c, that would be like some constant to the power n. So whenever n, the input size is in the exponent, that would be called infeasible. And there's a, 
a kind of name for this idea, which isn't, it's called the Cobham Edmonds thesis. It's not really a theorem or something that we could prove. It's just an idea that's from uh, kind of early days of computational analysis is just saying that if something's polynomial time, then it can be feasibly solved on a computer, uh, maybe. And if it's not polynomial time, then we can't really expect to solve it with computers in a reasonable amount of time. You can kind of relate this to Moore's law and the idea that the processing power of computers is increasing exponentially as time goes on. What that means is that if you have any polynomial time algorithm, but your hardware is getting exponentially faster, you can hope that eventually you're, even if the problem is too tough to solve right now, eventually our hardware will catch up and we'll be able to do it. But if you have an exponential time algorithm, then it doesn't matter that hardware is getting so much faster every year. We can kind of say that, all right, this thing, which is like this integer factorization algorithm we just looked at for a 400 byte integer, that algorithm will never finish. Um, no matter what kind of computer somebody comes up with 10 years from now, as long as it's a classical computer, and we're not uh, going into the quantum world, then that that's, I can rest asleep peacefully knowing that that's not going to work. And so viewed this way, our integer factorization is actually really slow in terms of the size of that integer. So just a little bit of a preview of what we're going to talk about next. We're all we're trying to get down to encryption with RSA. And the real next thing to understand, which we'll see in the next unit, is how do we do um, math mod n, mod an integer. Um, so you, you probably can figure out how you would add mod n. You just add and then take mod n. But in particular, division is really important for the RSA algorithm, so we have to understand that. And that's where the Euclidean algorithm comes in that allows us to do division. Then we'll talk about how does the actual RSA um, algorithm work and a little bit about the analysis of it since this is an algorithms and analysis class. Our goal in this class is not really to be great at applying RSA or, or to be the best um, users of crypto. That's more like in your IT 452 class um, that Dr. Oler and Dr. Choi are teaching. We're trying to understand the bones of it and what are the uh, high level like algorithmic ideas that are used in this crypto system and, and in encryption in general. Um, so that's, that's where we're headed. That'll be the next things we talk about. Thanks for your time from today, and I'll see you next time.